Good morning. After Sandy Hook, the Monday after Sandy Hook, I'm sure you all had conversations on the Friday and Saturday and Sunday with uh, family, friends, staff members, and received as probably copious amounts of emails uh, as we all did. Uh, I received a, a telephone call from my daughter, a first grade teacher, and she asked, Dad, you're an expert in this. What should I tell my little ones? I'm not an expert. I do school policing. I told her, do what you do as a teacher. She called me that afternoon on Monday afternoon and said, I decided to ask my little ones if, they, if anyone could tell me what a vowel is. My whole class raised their hand. And when I called on Timmy, he said, Mrs. Cook, I don't know what a vowel is, but I know you can buy one on the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Immediately went to little Tommy, who also had his, raised up, his hand raised, and little Tommy said, I don't know what a bowel is either, but my mom said if my new puppy has one more bowel movement in the house, <laughs> he's going to have to live outside. That is their life. And for the most part, what I say in my introduction is that is the life of the people that you see every day. And those are the people that we want raising and teaching our children. And the people in this room are the people that we want to touch in their lives. Lieutenant Jones and I, and the gentleman in the room that we'll introduce, we deal with murder, death, kill. And we don't deal very much. People call us when bad things happen, or are about to happen, or call us to ask us to stop what they believe is going to happen. And that's what we do. So presentations are probably not our strength. We're going to do our very best. On behalf of Superintendent Ladd, I'd like to thank him for allowing our staff uh, to make this presentation. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, the people that we work with and for. Uh, we wear different uniforms, but to the most part, we are the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. They run our division. Direct oversight by Sheriff Jones and these gentlemen here. So although we have different stars and bars, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department operate everything that we do in Elk Grove in the area of law enforcement and give us all of this advice comes from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. So Lieutenant Jones, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having us out here today. You know, on behalf of Ser uh, Sheriff Scott Jones, we're incredibly proud of the partnerships we have with the school districts of this county. Um, as the largest law enforcement agency in the county, uh, we are the direct responders for the majority of the districts in this room. Uh, and we take that responsibility quite seriously. You know, we have part direct partnerships uh, with many of the districts, whether it be in contract form, MOU form, whether it be part of the customers we serve on a daily basis out on patrol, or whether it be through off-duty programs providing support to athletic events or school dances or other activities occurring on there. These events, as infrequent as they are, are serious and very grave. And it's workshops like this that help us get together, prepare for those events, to, because we know we're never going to stop one from being initiated. But what we can do is minimize and mitigate the amount of damage, the amount of injury, and the amount of loss of life that will occur. And we can help reinstitute that reunification and then return to normalcy as quickly as possible in an environment that's safe. The presentation you're going to see today is one of the more robust programs we have within the county. It's a collaborative effort between the Elk Grove School uh, District Police as well as the Sheriff's Department. Um, it has evolved over several years, uh, and it really can be used as a template for how things within your districts you know, should look. Mind you, the law enforcement response is going to be similar. It's going to be very dynamic, it's going to be very quick, and it won't often be pretty. It's going to take some time for us to come in and actually establish that face to it to where there's an organizational structure. Our mission on the onset is a neutralization of a bad guy, someone who's actively involved in hurting and or killing people on your campuses. We want you to know that and we want you to come out with that understanding here today. You know, one of the uh, jobs I hold one of the prouder jobs I hold is the commander of the uh, Special Enforcement Detail of our department, which is our SWAT team. And I brought with us Sergeant uh, Randy Wynn and Sergeant Shan Lewis, who are my two team leaders for that. And they are absolute experts 
in the area of active shooter and active killer events. Uh, and, and I know they take that role very seriously. Uh, we are leaders in this region, and we educate the majority of law enforcement response that will occur to these campuses. So we're very proud to be here. We're very proud to be a part of this workshop today, and we hope that we can all benefit from it. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant John Randazzo, who is our liaison to the Elk Grove School District. Good morning. I think uh, we'll uh, launch right into this presentation. Um, actually, there is uh, two other people that I'd like to introduce here from the Sheriff's Department. We have uh, Sergeant Mike Haynes, and we also have Sergeant Joe Basham, who are assigned to Homeland Security. And so they, uh, they come with great interest in, in what we're presenting to you, can, and they are uh, our representatives with the Homeland Security. Today our objectives here, the things that we're going to go over here, is because there's such a high degree of active shooter and the Sandy Hook incident that we are all dealing with that have shaken us to our core. Um, some of the active shooter incidents that have occurred nationally and also locally, we'll talk about those. What you can expect from law enforcement when they land on your campus. Also, what school employees can do in response to these critical incidents. And we'll talk about this temporary transfer of authority. And that's when we come in, emergency personnel, and take over your campus. And as you see, we will take over your campus, but we will give it back. <laughs> and sometimes administrators have a hard time with that, us coming in and taking over their campuses. And we will uh, touch on the incident command post. And then finally, and you're probably looking at all these numbers and stuff and these, this uh, BBC pipe here. School planning, preparation, and practice. First off, a definition of an active shooter. One or more suspects, and I think what you will normally find is more often than not, it's a single person it's pretty hard to convince another person unless you're a terrorist organization or something like that hey i got this great idea we're going to go to the shopping mall we're going to go to this school and we're going to try and murder countless people um, engaged in random systematic violence demonstrating the intent to actively and immediately cause death and that's it death or serious bodily entry to potential victims and when they go their their main thing is to kill as many people as possible. The activity is not contained and the suspect has access to additional victims. Lots of people in schools, shopping malls, and uh, we try and, and bring sense to these senseless things and it's, it's quite difficult. And the violence is carried out over a continuous or extended period of time. Randy, did you want to elaborate on, on what I, I said there? I, I know that. Sure. Hi, I'm Randy Wynn. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a sergeant with the Sheriff's Department and uh, one of the team leaders of the Special Enforcement Detail. I've uh, been in the department now for like 25 years and spent the last 15 uh, working in special weapons and tactics. So I've been around since uh, Columbine and, and even before. And although we've had a lot of talk and the media typically sensationalizes active shooter incidents, they've really been going on since, uh, well, early, uh, late 1920s. The first documented incident was in, uh, was the Bath Schoolhouse Massacre in 1927. Still to this date, the deadliest uh, U.S. school massacre in, in, our, in history in the United States, uh, where the gentleman there didn't use a firearm but used dynamite uh, to uh, kill 38 and, and injure 58. Uh, but since then, we've had the Texas Tower incident at the University of Austin, Austin Texas, Texas. Probably many of you remember that, when Charles Whitman, a uh, United States Marine Corps uh, officer candidate, someone who had gotten uh, or received uh, uh, Accolations for being a, a marksman and also got a good conduct medal, uh, shot and killed 14 and injured 32. But since then, we've had a ton of them. Paducah, Kentucky, Jonesboro, Arkansas, uh, Springfield, Oregon, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech, Columbine. They just keep happening and happening. We've had well over 100 incidents in the last 15 years. In California alone, we've had Stockton, Oliver, San Diego, Santee, Sacramento. Uh, they just keep going on and on. So. Uh, with Columbine, obviously, in 1999, we had a big shift in our response tactics. That was the one where law enforcement had to really open their eyes and recognize that traditional response tactics of isolating, containing, evacuating those in harm's way or line of fire, and then negotiating uh, wasn't going to work. 
Active shooter incidents are a whole new animal for us. So whereas time teamwork tactics and negotiations work really well in a traditional crime in progress, a traditional barricaded suspect, a traditional hostage situation, it's, it's absolute failure in an active shooter situation. Um, so we changed our tactics in, after Columbine. Everybody did. Nobody, uh, no longer will officers isolate, contain, and stand by for a SWAT team to arrive and resolve the situation. It's really incumbent upon the first responders to employ what we refer to as immediate action and rapid deployment. That's where the officers are going to get in there and use contact teams to locate and neutralize the threat posed by a suspect. Uh, you know, when you talk about Virginia Tech, still, as you guys probably know from the recent media coverage, still the, the single, the deadliest, most, uh, the most, the deadliest uh, single gunman incident in United States history, uh, where I can never pronounce his name, So Ho Cho or whatever it was, uh, killed 32 people. Uh, you know, with Sandy Hook Elementary, though, last week or last month, uh, where Lanza killed 26 and injured two, it brings to the forefront, forefront the continued need to, you know, look at our emergency <coughs> action plans, consider the components of an action plan, uh, talk about our response capabilities, again, revitalize and refresh those relationships with our partners, uh, maybe rewrite or refresh some of those MOUs, but talk about what it is we can do to make sure we're doing everything possible to minimize the risk to our school districts and our children. So that's what we're here to do today. I didn't mean to take over too much. As necessary, I will uh, jump in and throw some comments uh, where you see fit. Very good, thank you, Randy. As, as Randy alluded to, that these active shooter incidents are very dynamic. And, and that's not necessarily a positive thing when we say dynamic. These, these are generally not contained and are constantly evolving the actions usually of the suspects, sometimes victims, bystanders, and even officers. So suspects can go in, they can start killing people, they could decide uh, once they know that uh, emergency personnel have arrived, they could uh, normally commit suicide, they might decide to take hostages. Um, victims can also um, change the dynamics of this. As you can imagine, when uh, emergency personnel are coming in and you have death and destruction all around you and people are grabbing at your legs and you're trying to address the situation, you have bystanders, maybe somebody who lives across the street, hears things that are going on and decides to take matters in their own hand, grabs their shotgun, runs across the street. Emergency personnel are coming in, knowing that there's an active shooter. Don't know who's who. We just know that there's somebody shooting up the joint and we don't know how many, and there may be a possibility that this person with a good intention ends up getting killed or seriously injured by emergency personnel responding to the scene. So as you can see, it, it just, it can evolve, it, it can change in a blink of an eye. And these active shooters typically engage in targets of opportunity that are unaware, unprepared, they're, they're not looking for a firefight. They're, they're not looking um, for something that has a strong security presence. Usually the locations contain large numbers of people, typically unarmed and unsuspecting, and their areas of choice, schools, shopping malls, and workplace, workplace violence. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, touch on a little bit about that. And uh, so with that, I am going to turn this portion of the presentation over to Sergeant Chris Mora, who is uh, our sergeant assigned to the Oak Grove Unified School District. And he supervises 10 of the school resource officers that are um, assigned regionally throughout the Oak Grove Unified School District. And he, um, in fact, has uh, experienced an active shooter situation, and, and I'm sure he will touch on that. So, thank you. Good morning. Like Lieutenant said, my name is Chris Mora. Uh, a little bit of this is going to be a review from what Randy just talked about. Columbine happened in 1999. It, like Randy said, it set the new standard for our response as law enforcement to how we were going to react to an active shooter. Um, since then, we have completely change the way we respond and like Randy says we no longer wait for a SWAT team to arrive we engage quickly 
2007, that was the Virginia Tech incident. 32 people were killed. Um, that's the most people that have been killed recent, within recent times. I mean, other than what Randy spoke about, 32 people lost their lives that day. And then we come to Connecticut, which honestly, it just rocked this nation to the core. To set a new standard when a subject is willing to kill kindergartners. Recent incidents, Barrett Middle School, 12 hostages were taken. That was in North Sacramento. One of the sheriff, sheriff deputies from Sacramento County negotiated and talked the child into giving up. No one was injured in that incident. 2003 was Rio Casadero. That's a school within the Elk Grove Unified School mm -hmm. District. I personally was there along with four other guys who currently work for me. Can't replace experience. I remind Chief Jenkins of that all the time. There's five of us now who have actual experience in the active shooter. And then Schnell Elementary in 2011, up the hill, Highway 50, where a custodian killed the principal. Sorry about that. And here is a map since 1966 of all the active shooter incidents in the nation and a few in Mexico since 1966. And I'd like to introduce Randy Wynn. I was told you're speaking. Okay, what else would you like me to talk about? <laughs> okay, so I guess the whole thing, I don't want to get too much into tactics for you guys because that's really not going to affect you too much. But as they identified, it's really incumbent upon the arriving resources uh, to get inside and immediately deploy so we can mitigate the threats posed by an active shooter. If we delay, it's going to result in additional casualties or death. We know that. So we use that immediate action and rapid deployment protocol to get inside, go directly to the source of the threat, and try to deal with it. We refer to it, it's our soft and sanitized word of neutralize the threat. But that could be anything from talking them down, arresting them, putting handcuffs on them, up to and including actually killing them. Now one of the things you probably don't think about a lot, but we do, is our rules of engagement and deadly force. And I just want to give you some insight into that so you realize what this means in an active shooter situation and how and why it's different from a regular law enforcement response. Uh, every agency in the country, uh, use of force policy, deadly force in particular, comes from the United States Supreme Court decision in, in Tennessee v. Garner. It's a 1985 case. Uh, basically says when it is appropriate. It clarified the fle fleeing felon doctrine, if you remember that back in the day. Officers had the authority to use deadly force to take any felony suspect into custody. Uh, but subsequent to this case where a burglary suspect was shot in the back of the head and killed as he fled from a residence, uh, the Supreme Court intervened and wanted to modify that somewhat. In doing so, what they said was there were certain instances where deadly force was appropriate and necessary. Uh, one, any time an officer uh, reasonably believes he's in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death, or two, an officer believes somebody else is in an imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death. That's the typical uses of force you may see on TV on a nightly basis, particularly in Sacramento County, uh, or these officer-involved shootings within our region. But there are actually two other categories that we should discuss, and that's where active shooters come into play. Uh, the next one is to affect the arrest, uh, recapture the escape, or prevent the escape of somebody the officer has probable cause to believe committed a violent felony. Okay, certainly, that would include carjackings, robberies, rape, forcible rape, uh, uh, felony assaults, particularly stabbings and shootings, and particularly active shooter incidents. The next caveat is if the officer has cause to believe that the felony suspect to be apprehended may cause additional serious bodily injury or death if he gets away. Certainly fits in an active shooter incident. So you've got to recognize that the mindset for an officer going to an active shooter call, we identify those by incident indicators, and I'll talk about that in a moment. If an officer goes to an active shooter call where there's bloodshed, carnage, and death, multiple calls, okay, location, if it's occurring at a school, I mean, unfortunately for you folks, the first box is checked. If it's occurring at a campus or an institution where you work, the first box is checked. We're already thinking, could it be an active shooter incident? But for law enforcement officers, it could be any public venue, movie theaters like Colorado, sporting events, any mass gathering of, of people or children or personnel, and we refer to those typically as soft targets. When you talk about kindergartens, that's the ult ultimate soft target. Um, sometimes I get up, I see a shiny object, and I get distracted. But uh, so, um, what was I talking about? <laughs> Somebody help me. Use of force. Use of 
course, I'm sorry, and he said deep. That's my cue not to go so deep. So what I wanted to do, though, is tell you the difference between a traditional response and an active shooter only because for our officers, this is different. This is a situation where the suspect doesn't need you to give you a reason to use deadly force. This is a situation where the suspect can have to give you a reason not to use it. So if these suspects don't immediately surrender and throw down their guns upon confrontation, then chances are there's going to be law enforcement shots fired. Okay, that's how we're going to mitigate these threats. We don't have time to negotiate when there are potentially more than one suspect running around on your school campus and injuring or killing your students. Okay? Um, so that's one, one of the components. When I talk about incident indicators, again, Location of the incident, number one, okay? Uh, again, unfortunately for you, the, the box is checked on the schools. But again, any public venue. Uh, next, how many calls did we get? Are we getting multiple 911 calls? People indicating there are shots being fired. It's ongoing. The situation's not contained. Uh, the suspect uh, has injured multiple people. They need multiple ambulances. Um, the next one would be uh, access to additional victims. That's actually in the definition of an active shooter incident. We know those traditional crimes in progress, the barricaded suspects and the hostage situations caused maybe by a crime interrupted such as a bank robbery. We know, again, those are best handled through time, teamwork, and tactics and negotiation. But these particular situations an active shooter are not. Any time that we don't utilize to take the situation under control or seize the initiative could be exploited by the bad guy. Okay, he's going to kill more people. So if it's ongoing and not contained and the suspect has access to additional victims, that's a major component. Um, and then the other one we sometimes see is some diversion tactics. Some of the more sophisticated or well-planned incidents involve suspects who called in something else somewhere else, uh, away from that particular area, district, or division of your first responders to get our resources going to an explosion or a mass casualty car crash or a train wreck, somewhere else so that when the actual thing occurs, the incident occurs where they're going to be, officers aren't in the immediate presence. Now, some of the mitigating factors, uh, again, in the definition, has access to additional victims. So if for some reason the suspect no longer has victims, uh, because what, I guess what i got to illustrate for you is that not all shots fired calls where you're present or where officers are on scene are active shooter incidents. In fact, after our initial training for law enforcement personnel in 99 with active shooter, we actually saw the pendulum swing too far to the other side. Every time an officer was on scene and a shot got fired, somebody called active shooter and the officers were rushing into the situation. Um, that obviously exposes our officers and even you, the public, to a little bit of substantially more risk. So we don't want to use those tactics when they're not necessary. Um, when, uh, so some of the mitigating factors, if, the, if, there are, if there are no longer any victims, maybe the suspect has run out of victims, maybe he's killed everybody, maybe the victims have uh, sheltered in place or self-evacuated, he no longer has access to them, or he has, uh, maybe he's run out of ammunition, or maybe his weapon has malfunctioned, or maybe, um, uh, what else, uh, he no longer has the ability to inflict injury, then it, it's no, at least it's no longer, it may have been, but it's no longer an active shooter incident. So just because it started out as an active shooter incident doesn't mean it's, not, it's still going to be one by the time we get there. So we kind of kind of evaluate that. If it gets to a situation where the bad guy has barricaded himself in a classroom and maybe holding you and some of your students hostage, those situations may be better handled through time, teamwork, tactics, and negotiation. What we're really looking for is a peaceful, nonviolent resolution. So wherever possible, we're trying to teach our officers to recognize some of those indicators uh, so that we don't pose additional threats or, threats or risks to people. Um, any questions that I might bring up if we talk about this? Any specifically? Don't be afraid. Really nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank they, you. Joke, they joke about how you guys do really <laughs> Tom was saying that you're the people we want affecting and touching our children. I have a joke, I've ruined more kids than most people. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not very good on the hands-on stuff with children, but uh, again, if you've got a question, please ask it. I'd be happy to elaborate. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Sergeant Wynn. I think, I think one of the other things, uh, he's the doom and gloom guy, and I'm going to tell you how to do, what to do on campus, how to do things. Um, what, one of the things you have to remember is that the officers are going to go by the injured. And, and uh, in an active shooter incident to help neutralize whether it's, um, you know, end the situation however we need to, whether it's, you know, putting, uh, getting somebody, this, the bad guy in a room where he's held up or, or shooting him. So uh, don't be surprised if, if you see that happen where uh, officers are not treating the injured because that's one, one of the pieces of the active shooter training. Uh, school personnel. Like Chief Jenkins talked about earlier, um, you know, we all, the, uh, just take a moment to look at this picture. This is uh, uh, educators training, and, and I have 
two older uh, teenagers that are still in school. And these are the, these are the folks that you, you are the folks that we want teaching our kids. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on is is that as as leaders on your campuses or or superintendents, you're going to be asking folks that do education for a living to get into this world uh, that they may not have ever touched before. Um, it may not have ever. Uh, you know, the closest they would have seen to any of this is a movie. And so understand that, we understand um, that everybody responds to crises different. Um, I, you know, my, my mom, when, when uh, my brother was about five years old, so I was about nine, my brother had an accident on, in the house and was bleeding and my mom ran down the street. And that was my mom. And I'm thinking, well, you're the adult. You should be. But people respond differently. So just understand, we, we recognize that. And, and we, we are willing to work through it. And, and part of our preparation is, is that. So um, and just, again, understand that as you're putting your plans together, your comprehensive safe school plans together, and that piece about emergency response, that those, you know, understand that those are the folks that you're working with and, and they may not have had that experience before. Uh, what, what's the immediate response for the school? Uh, definitely we want you to call 911 because we want to get, um, you know, the Sheriff's Department, whatever law enforcement agency is, is servicing your area there as, as soon as possible. But you really have, you know, a couple of different options, lockdown and escape. Um, we put confront on here because I, I want to touch on that. I want to, you know, in the media, we have seen um, people all across the country talking about confronting suspects and things like that. That is not something we're going to recommend. Um, it, it is certainly an individual um, choice at the time of the incident. Uh, but, I, but what I will say is, is that um, the, the more often that you can take care of yourself and the children that you serve, the better you're going to be. Again, I, I certainly wouldn't want to go to a, a gunfight with a knife, and I certainly wouldn't want to go to a knife fight with nothing. So just understand that confrontation may not uh, get, get positive results for you. And so we, we only put that up there because it's been out there and people have been talking about it, but uh, we, we do not necessarily recommend that action. Uh, when calling 911, this is just real basic stuff, but I, I did want to touch on a couple of things on here. Uh, be as calm and clear and concise, concise as possible when communicating with 911. It doesn't necessarily even have to be in an active shooter or a, a school emergency, but when you're at home, they ask a lot, tons of questions. And, and they, all they want to hear is the answer to the questions they're asking. So if you get into the mindset that these are kind of some of the things that they're going to ask you, it won't be a surprise when, when you have to make that call uh, in a crisis. And again, uh, I want to reiterate, we all, unless you've been in a crisis and you know you, how you have responded, you, it's going to be difficult to know what, you're in, you know, what you're, the outcome is going to be on, on your end in terms of emotional um, you know, ability to, to deal with it. So um, that, that's what to expect when you call 911. And again, just remain as calm and, and clear as you can. Uh, lockdown. Um, if immediate escape or evacuation is not possible, lock down or attempt to, lock, to barricade yourself. Um, also, administrators should lock down the school when you, uh, when contacted by law enforcement. So you may get a phone call into the office. You may get an officer knocking on the on the door of your your office, saying telling you to lock down. But that's not the only time. If you see an intruder, or or a staff member sees an intruder, lock down. Um, you know, start that process as, as quickly as possible um, and or if somebody reports it to you. Um, you know, you'd also lock down if there was uh, any other kind of emergency um, that, that you, you know, that, that's going to affect kids and, and, and your safety. So um, the one thing, uh, additional thing I want to talk about is lockdown announcement. We, we've gone kind of, schools have gone through this thing about using a secret code word. Um, to lock down, don't do it. Just say lock down. Um, many, many campuses uh, don't, you know, they have substitute employees uh, that are on campus that may not know <coughs> Mr. Jones is in the building. Code word for lockdown. Just say lock down, get everybody locked down. Do we care if the bad guy knows that we're locking down? No. We just want to make sure we're safe. So 
um, and, you know, and we'll talk about practicing and planning and doing all that in a few minutes, but um, that's pretty important.